Welcome to Mindset, Mood and Movement, a systemic approach to human behavior, performance and well-being. Our psychological, emotional and physical health are all connected. And my guests and I endeavor to share knowledge, strategies and tools for you to enrich your life and work. Today, we are considering why chasing work-life balance is a bad idea and what you can do instead. I'm joined by Claire Elms, my guest, and she is the owner of Inspire You Wellbeing. That's a global award-winning therapy training and coaching world business. Today, we are considering why chasing work-life balance is a bad idea and what you can do instead. I'm joined by my guest, Claire Elms, and Claire is the founder of Inspire You Wellbeing. It's a global award-winning therapy, training, and coaching wellness business. And Claire is a really great guest to have on. She's worked with stress, performance, lifestyle, executive coaching, the whole host of things that are really going to be important to work-life balance. And Claire knows full well just how important this is, having experienced burnout in 2015. So she's on a on campaign to help people now, as I too am on a campaign to help people understand things through this podcast about how we can integrate our mind, our emotions and our body to make changes on a practical level. Now, when considering work-life balance, in this episode, we go into some key things. What do we mean by work-life balance? Help you understand that. What are some of the factors that are going to get in your way? Some of the cognitive biases, some of the personality styles, some of the behaviors that may be going on for you, which you just hadn't seen. And we're going to pull those out and hopefully help you understand it in a much clearer context. How to use attention what's happening with your environment, things such as your smartphone, all of these things that contribute to whether work-life balance is going for you or against you. And we kind of pull it all together with some really salient, strong points of actions you can take to start finding your own way into work-life balance. So welcome, Claire. Hi, thanks for having me. I'd love to start with what does work-life balance mean to you? I think it's one of those concepts, isn't it, that's really hard to talk about and really hard to define. But for me, work-life balance is about making sure I have time to do my work, but time to do the things that I enjoy in life as well. So spending time with family and friends, doing things for myself, and as well as integrating work within that and how it works for me. So for me, work isn't a nine to five. So it's how I make my working day work for me in a way that gives me time to have life as well. Really nice. Yeah, I, I guess uh, maybe I should bounce the question back to myself. Work-life balance. Yeah, what work-life balance. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I see it slightly differently. I don't actually see it as work-life balance with a distinction as such. I see it all as life. So if I, I, I see things in a slightly different perspective, it's just how I see the world. But I see things as life, this totality of life that I have the gift of being given. And within that, some of my energy and my time goes to work. And there's different nuances of my work as well, from podcasting to coaching to the running of the business. And di- they have different qualities, but there's that aspect. And then there's other elements in my life, as you've alluded to. There's personal, for me, it's fitness, there's health, activities, all these kind of things. And I find it more as a whole system that I try to get the right measure of But of course, this is what we want to share today is about understanding this, I think from not just my perspective and perhaps Claire's perspective, but really help you find what your perspective is. So we we're clearer on it. But I have clients in my coaching practice and they come to me and they're super busy. They they're either directors that run a business or freelance and they work hard. They put a lot of hours in, they they're, they're grafting. And that's fine. That's okay if that's your thing. But if there's no time and energy left for health for fitness for family then it of course can skew into the other side of of course unbalance or being you know pushed into overworking and too much attention there when and where did you start working in your domain claire with work-life balance with the clients that you work with perhaps you can share a little more about that story so we understand your 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 journey in this yeah sure so i've come from a therapeutic background so i started practicing with clients as a therapist in 2006 which feels like a long time ago now 
But yeah, and I was working in the NHS and I was working in the county council, doing stuff with the council, with children and families predominantly at the time. And then I was looking for how to get what I wanted because I couldn't see a job that suited what I wanted. So I ended up um, setting up self-employed. A friend, a life coach, actually, she, she was quite inspirational to me. She said, if you can't find the job you want, why not create it? And it was enough to plant a seed for me. So I started going, okay, let's do that then. So I, I did start the business in 2008 and then sl- slowly added days and produced time in employment. And I think for me, a lot of clients come to me around feeling stressed, overworked, burnt out. And I've seen the back end, I guess. I've seen like where people get to when they get to the point of no return, if you like. I've also hit it myself a little bit in 2015. I was working 60 hours a week. I thought I was invincible and then I really wasn't. And had I not got married and had three weeks off on honeymoon, I would have definitely been in a really dark place. But as it was, I had enough time to step back and reflect and go, actually, I don't want to do this anymore. And I think it's really interesting. I see so many similar patterns. And so subsequently, since 2015, I've been much more focusing on the preventative rather than working with severe and enduring, which was what I was doing. So I was working with really high end stuff in, in the NHS and yeah. And so pivoted more into coaching at that point and started focusing more on how to stop people getting to that point in the first place and using my experience as a bit of a, as as a guide really, because I would never have gone to get help. I didn't see I had a problem. Like I just didn't recognize that that was a thing. And I think since COVID, there's been a massive shift for people. I think people have started to really recognize that actually they don't want to do certain things the way that they've been doing them. And I think we, we all carry on doing what we're doing because that's what we've always done. And actually, at some point, we can't carry on. So I think it's really important to focus on this kind of elusive work-life balance thing because it's a concept and it's made up and it doesn't and it's different for everybody. But actually, it's a thing. And if we get it, working in a in a way that works for us personally and and how my work-life balance will it will be different to how your work-life balance looks which will be different to how someone else's looks and like the word balance is is always like we've both talked about integration haven't we and whether that there is a balance at all or whether whether you feel like you have to balance something because when you're balancing you feel like you're juggling something and then it feels like it's always going to be out of kilter so it's quite interesting the more I delve into working with people on a preventative level when we start to look at like what your week looks like and where your energy is placed and how you focus it's just a really interesting way of working now and I really enjoy helping people to make it work better for no, them. No it's really nice. I just want to speak to a couple of things that you said that really caught my attention. The first one is is we we do what we do we just carry on as we are and this is such a such a slippery customer you probably know but if, if, if we're listening and you're not sure we have, all have cognitive biases, which are thinking biases. We, we think in certain ways and we're predisposed to certain ones. A really big one is status quo bias. Now, it's yeah, status quo, and I don't mean the, the rock group, <laughs> if anyone remembers them. <laughs> but status quo as in staying the same. Now, we are, our, our mind is a bit like our body. It's seeking homeostasis. We like to remain the same. And there's, there's lots of science around this about how the brain works and, and so forth. But from a practical point of view, knowing that we have status quo bias is that we will always lean into what we know and what we've done. The problem with that can be if what we've been doing and what we've always done is overworking, under-prioritizing family or under-prioritizing fitness and health, then it will continue. And it's not because anyone's doing anything wrong. It's probably because we're simply not conscious of these patterns playing. And the first thing around status quo bias is, is to simply name it and see it. But see, if you're like, okay, I've always, I don't know, work a 12-hour day, don't bother eating properly, don't work out, then it's naming that and, okay, how is this going to work? And looking around you for some other people and getting examples of that. So knowing that we are predisposed to it is the first point of changing it. And that, that really intrigues me. Now, you also mentioned about balance and uh, uh, fascinated with linguistics. And balance, to me, would seem a bit like, you know, the, the right scale. And I don't know if, if we got this idea in our mind about we have to have balance, then implicit in that, if your work week is 60 hours and your home life is less, 
you're already out of balance just from an hour's point of view. You're, you're already out of balance. So you're already losing, which is a negative. And I, I struggle with the word balance if it's misunderstood. Certainly in my mind, and for people I work with, we actually probably need to understand it better. And it's not an either-or situation. I, like, I'm only working, I'm only at home. Because sometimes when you go to work, you're, you'll bring your nervous system. You'll bring your backstory. <laughs> you'll bring your biases, who you are. You can't not, right? And same as when you go home, you might, certainly for those of us who run businesses, do our own thing, we often have insights whilst walking the dog in the shower. And it's not wrong, but it's understanding this and, and starting to see it for what it is. Um, and the last thing I really want to speak to you about what you said, and, and, and we want to, I'd like to go deeper, is energy. Now, I work with energy a lot from a quantum physics description to a body energy f description, whatever term it is, but this is, our, our entire body has an electron. Every cell has an electrical signal and the nervous system runs electrics. We all have energy. And I think it's something more interesting to talk to, and I want to get your thoughts on this, Claire, that instead of balance, like where is your energy? How much energy does uh, work take? Because some people's work doesn't take a lot because it's flow state. Some people's home life can be challenging and that can take a lot more. Perhaps if you've got young children or something like that, it's demanding. Claire, how are you working with, with this energy perhaps principle around the clients you're working with, with work life? I think similar to you. I think it's really interesting. I was talking to someone the other day, actually. In, in the NHR, it's very segregated. So you have your mental health teams, your physical health teams, you have your different teams for different conditions. And so... If you have a condition that needs support, you'll go to so-and-so for this and so-and-so for that and this team for that and this team for that. And it's, it's very segregated. And what I have loved about Sonny leaning into my own business is that I bring the energy, I bring the physical and the mental and everything else together. Because for me, you cannot operate on one without the other. You need to have an understanding of tiredness levels. You need to have an understanding of where your focus goes. There's that whole, my, one of my favorite sayings is like focus, focus goes where energy flows. So if your focus is in the right place, then your energy goes in the right place and it becomes like a flow state and it becomes, there's all the science behind it, isn't there? And, and it's, it's really interesting. And I think when the more I kind of work with physical practitioners and the more I work doing more integrated practice myself, I've, I trained as a breathwork facilitator last year. And that for me really, really opened my eyes to breathing. <laughs> Basically, you know, understanding that when we're not breathing properly, that actually impacts on absolutely everything, like our mental and our physical state. And the more I'm working with different practitioners, I'm really leaning into understanding my own body. I have hypermobility and so my body doesn't do what it should do. So really understanding, I've just accepted that for years. And then I've worked, I found a practitioner who's gone from here yeah, and you can change that. And I'm like, oh, I've just accepted that for so long. So it's really interesting. The more you lean into different things and become aware of things yourself, just the kind of energy really interests me. And, and it can be seen as a bit woo-woo, I think. And, and I never quite fully understood it when I worked in organizations. It's only been probably the last five years I've really leaned into it. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, I know some people still struggle with the term energy, perhaps don't understand it, but let, let's just clear this up now. It's neuroscience, right? We got data on this all over the place. This is neuroscience. This is neuropsychobiology. This is the electrome understanding about how the body works. This is uh, quantum mechanics. Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of heavyweight sciences, which now we understand this stuff. And to put it simply, metabolism is energy exchange, right? So if you eat uh, a bowl of porridge and some nuts in the morning, that is trans, transduced into energy in your body. It's broken down to different things. And if you didn't eat any food at all, you'd be knackered, you'd be tired. Now, so we know this. So we want to just disband with any of this idea that energy is woo-woo. This, this, this is exactly where we need to work out. The problem I have, and I'm a big fan of Oliver Berkman, 4,000 Weeks, if uh, I should put a link in the show, brilliant. And because he's a time management guy and he's wrote this amazing book. And when we think about time, we might look at our working day and go, well, eight hours. And we go, like, at home, we've got four hours with family. Or I've got, for me, it's like, hours in the gym or something like that but hours don't translate very well to energy because if for instance so my work is is i'm not interested in hours i'm interested in energy time and i, I there's a time boundary of course i know the, the shape of it but 
how much energy do I need for a podcast? How much energy do I need to do coaching work to really help people get what they want? That's less about the amount of hours I need to do. It's more about the amount of energy I need to bring to it. And the same with home life. If you go home and you're at home, quote, but your mind is still at your desk or your mind is still with your client, you're not there, right? So your balance is not there. I wanted to, again, just to speak to something you said then. For my regular listeners, people know that my approach of mindset, mood and movement, this ecosystem approach of well-being and personal development is, is how I work. And you can't not be yourself. Even if you're in a professional role, you have your body, the architecture. You have your nervous system, your digestive system. It is all there. And if your breath patterns are all over the place, as you've alluded to, if your emotions are dysregulated, because that's connected to breath and sometimes to trauma, then it's very, very hard to achieve one's elusive work-life balance if our physical and our emotional system is out of balance or out of cohesion. So that's a really important thing. And I want to go a little f more focus onto this as the individual. When we're thinking about energy as an individual and we're looking to, to, to get balance, how are you helping some of the people you work with actually achieve that? What, what are the practical steps that you're finding are now working to, to get a, a, better, a better way, let's say? Yeah, I think there's, there's some amazing things out there, isn't there? And it's really hard to answer that question because obviously it's different for the, for the individual, right? But one of the things I love doing with people is bringing that self-awareness piece in. So understanding yourself and how you operate is so pivotal, like how you make decisions. You talked about the status quo bias, right? How you, how you think, everything starts with the thought. I educate people on the thought, feeling, behavior loop and how when we have, like quite often people come to me because they're stressed or they're anxious or whatever, there's a, there's a, there's a thing, they're not sleeping, there's, they're feeling a bit um, flat or whatever it is. We can then work out, okay, where's that coming from? And this, this is in business and in personal, right? Because you can't separate the two. So if you are a business owner and you're working ridiculous hours, you're making decisions every day based on your thoughts. So if your thoughts are skewed in whatever capacity, then you're not able to, to make those good decisions. I talk a lot around that loop initially and also around understanding your personality, your energy levels and how your body works and, and that side of things. But you've also got like your personality, your like your sort of the way that your personality works and how like my personality is generally quite a fast paced person. So for me to step back and be slower, that takes effort, that takes energy. Whereas for someone like you, Sal, like you're much more of a slower person. <laughs> so you don't need me to like, I, I find sometimes I have to adapt my energy levels to certain people. Like I... I know I'm a fast paced person if I'm talking with someone that's not a fast paced. If I'm talking with someone that's a fast paced person, we'll go off on all sorts of tangents and have a brilliant conversation. <laughs> if I'm talking with a slower paced person, I have to really think and pull myself in and notice the pathways that are coming up in my head and going, oh, do I want to do that pathway? Do I want to do that pathway? And be much more reflective. And that's something that I've been working on a lot more recently because I know that feedback from, from various things is like just slow down a bit and I'm like I know I know I can't help it <laughs> I get I get excited and I get like passionate about things and so I go off on tangents I'm already doing that now but for me one of the things I really do is is really picking that person apart almost you're going okay so this is this is you as a person as a personality but that doesn't shape who you are fully so then you've got your values that you bring so what's important to you so for me Health, health is one of my main values. So being healthy, I would prioritize going and doing something for myself over other things because for me that's really important. If I'm if I'm going and doing work before I even start working, I will make sure I have time to go to the gym or go and do. I don't do the gym much anymore to be fair. It's like more fitness boot camps and runs and stuff like that. But or do yoga or something like that. I find that I need to do something like. When I look at my energy, I need to do something before I start work. I drop the kids off. It's all a bit hectic. My kids are young. They're, they're full on. Mornings can be quite stressful and hectic. I need time in between that and starting work to fully get into work and into my flow state. And if I'm not, if I, if I bounce straight to a nine o'clock meeting, I'm not fully present because I haven't had the time to decompress. And we talk about mental loads a lot. I work a lot with 
busy mums, busy mums that have about 20 different things they're doing at the same time. And it's really interesting, isn't it? The culture side of things, like when we, yeah, 20 years ago, mums didn't necessarily go to work as such. It was much more like mums did the household stuff and then the, 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 the dad went to work, earned the money, blah, blah, blah. Very stereotypical. But now, as women, we're like, yes, we're going to go and do those things. Brilliant. Gives us passion, purpose, excitement, all of that really positive stuff. But then also you're still having to do a lot of the mental load at home as well. And then you're also having to do like life admin. And quite often people then don't look after themselves. And I think the thing that we were talking about before was in itself was about a kind of importance of well-being and looking after ourselves, being aware of ourselves and where we're at and where we want to spend more of our time focusing. And then and then leaning into that and and creating clear actions on how we're going to get there. Because if we know that maybe we're not eating right because we're grabbing food on the go or we're not sleeping enough because we're going to bed at midnight and waking up at three o'clock in the morning working and stuff, there's there's things that we can do to change it. We don't have to just settle for the status quo. And I think that's really important because quite often we just do what we've always done. But it's just, and it's and it's our bodies and our mind's way of, of functioning, right? We don't think about getting dressed in the morning we probably put the same clothes on in the same order because it's our brain's way of not thinking as much and and doing things on autopilot and we have certain things that we do on autopilot but we can change those things those habits are not the way that it has to be and I think that's that's to me is like how to help people really don't lean into themselves and ultimately that improves performance productivity it, it improves absolutely everything yeah, right totally agree totally agree and it's something i see with the people i coach and, and work with in, in various capacities the one of the first questions if i'm working with someone who wants to i don't know, overcome an anxiety pattern a block most people don't come to coaching because it's all going well this is normally somebody that's either got blocked or stuck or they, they can't figure out a transition or there's some deep self-work to do. And one of the first questions I, I need to know is like, how is this person physically? Because if you are not sleeping, that, that fundamentally changes everything for your biochemistry to your psychology. If someone is not getting outdoors quite early in the morning, I know that the light's not coming in that person's retina, switching on their, their which is the, the only part of the brain that's external in the eye. That doesn't switch on then the cortisol pulse, which everything is about circadian rhythms in our body. Circadian rhythms, if they are out of whack, everything's out of whack. One of the simplest fixes is to be outdoors within ideally 30 minutes, but an hour, as soon as you wake up, lighting your eyes. Now, not looking at the sun, but lighting your eyes. So we've got the most basic, mm, wrong word, fundamental human requirements. We've got sleep. We have awake. We have the circadian rhythms running. All the biochemistry is running. And now we can go do a good day. For me, my day is always blocked out. Right? No one's available. I'm not available to a certain time. Like my first thing in the morning is exercise. I run, I swim, I gym, I train, I do loads of stuff. And for whole as a reason, firstly, I prefer it in the morning. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it after work. It just doesn't work. But also it's about it works for me. So it's about someone else. It might look like that. That pattern is after work. That's okay. But if you get the fundamentals in place, sleep nutrition, daylight, and the right amount of good, decent food, then you're already building the, the base, which, which intrigues me. Now, you mentioned something here, and it really caught my attention about personality. Now, I know, I was working with someone a little while back, and he was super successful, very, very busy. And he was so identified with his role at work, and it was, it was everything, like so consuming, as, as it can be as a business owner. This over-identification was part of the problem because if you're on the hedonic treadmill, that's this idea that we're, we're, we'll be happy when. And if you're north of, I don't know, 35 and you still think I'll be happy when, something's not working. It's just not working because if you can't be happy now, you're not going to be happy in 10 years. A few more quid in the bank is not going to change it. So this is really about what you said about personality and I, I call it identity, similar stuff. Over-identification. Absolutely. Over-identification with, with, let's say, your business identity, I see as part of the problem because then it becomes there's no space for Claire or Sal to be the person, a partner or friend or whatever that is. That's one of the kind of red flags I'm going to call out to people. If you're over-identified with work and you're chasing work-life balance, this is part of where we need to do some work, this over-identification, because there's, there's too much there. What are you seeing when you're working with people and you, and you touch on 
what I call identity, you call it personality. How have you seen changes? Have you got any examples of something that you've worked with? Yeah. So I think for me, like I see identity as a whole, as your, as your whole self almost, right? And then the personality, past experiences, I work a lot with trauma. And when I say trauma, I'm not talking about abuse and big things. I'm talking about your mum saying no when you're seven. There's, there's quite varying levels, like big T traumas and little T traumas, right? And they all have a massive impact. And positive experiences as well. I put a post out on LinkedIn this week about as, as, as 16 years ago, I did a free fall, did an accelerated skydive. And for me, that is one of the best achievements that I've ever had in my life. I think it's, a, it's an absolutely fantastic thing. And if anyone's thinking about it, they should definitely do it. It's, it's, it relates so much to the work that we do. You're pressuring yourself out of your comfort zone. Comfort zone, we talk about a lot, right? But you, you're striving for that process, that that. I, I have an adrenaline buzz. I need I need a challenge. I need something to do to to fulfill. And I really resonate with Johnny Wilkinson. I don't know who knows Johnny Wilkinson. Oh, he's a professional rugby player. Show him my age. Certain people under a certain age. It's quite funny. I was talking in my team about him, and they didn't know who he was because they are of a certain generation. <laughs> so I then started to feel quite old. But Johnny Wilkinson has openly come out and so has Tom Daly. Quite a few professional sports people. It happens a lot in their world. That kind of constant need to strive for the I'll be happy when, I'll be happy when. And then he was talking about when they won the World Cup. Like, what next? That was what they were striving for. And rather than feeling happy and content and celebrating that he just felt really flat and, and, and unclear and he went into a bit of an identity crisis and I think I, I, I see that happen and play out in so many clients that I work with where they're striving for something, striving for something, striving for something. Either it's unrealistic and they're never going to get there or they get to it and then they're like, what now? <laughs> and, and I think that's really, it really resonates with me and that kind of really being present in the moment. We, we do lots of stuff around goal setting. We do lots of stuff around looking at the past and, and the barriers and how to overcome the barriers. But for me, like, feeling pretty content and happy in the moment is quite hard to get because because of culture and society and this constant need to strive for something and it's about recognizing how far you've come and I think that's that's a lot of the stuff I do around identity is like how the personality the values the experiences all make up that person and then how that sort of helps you to make decisions in your life and like how it how it frames your thoughts and I think when we start to look at the sort of emotional intelligence in a in an overall arching kind of concept like trying to work out what is important to us from an emotional intelligence perspective and how we can strive to improve that really helps yeah. people improve yeah, amazing yeah it's really really nice to hear <laughs> funny isn't it that we we don't see it there's there's there's, there's the old, what do they call it? A parable. I'm not really good at doing this very well. So I'll make up my own version. But there's two fish. There are two fish swimming along one day. And this older fish swings, swims by and goes, morning, guys. The water's nice today. And off he goes. And the two young fish look at each other and go, what's water? Because, of course, the, the parable, but they're so immersed in water, they can't see it. They have no other reference point. And culture really pushes us for this work-life balance. And yet it also has a almost a contradictory message, like just drive harder, succeed more, get more money, grow, scale, whatever it is, it's push, 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 push. And therein, I think, lies part of our work-life problem because we assume it's a, perhaps a future-orientated thing. Like if I just make enough money or my business grows to a certain level, then I'll have the work-life balance. But work-life balance is actually a state of mind on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. And here's a funny thing that we can wrap our heads around we already live in the future that's a fact we live in the future of who you were five years ago and and sometimes it's really nice to go god yeah i remember being x y well, let's say 30 or 40 or whatever we are and like oh I, when i was 45 i was going to do this and, and like yeah you live in that future so if you were doing it back then the i'll be happy when whatever that is and you're not happy now because you just need a few more money a few more uh, pounds in the bank or a bit more scale in your business, then your process of doing it needs looking at. And then if we're striving for work-life balance and wondering why we don't have it, 
it comes down to perception and behavior connected, which we've already said about finding about people, which is, which is lovely. Now, I want to call out one of the red flags that really get in the way of work-life balance in a healthy way, which is the difference between how culture was probably 25 years ago, if you were a you know, working parent, whatever you are, doing your thing, compared to now because of, and I'm waving a smartphone at Claire. And on this smartphone is my telephone, my contacts and pictures. And yet there's my email, WhatsApp. It's all the facility for me to be still connected to my work identity or my work process. And I think we haven't seen it, but it's a little like leaving all your home doors open and inviting your colleagues just to walk in and out all day, all night. And it's very hard to beat because everyone has a smartphone and everyone's got all the connections on it. Question being, when we come home, whatever that is, or when we're not at work, how tempting is it to pick up on smartphone? Very, yeah. This is really tough, right? This is one of the biggest things I'm talking about with individuals and teams. I was doing some team coaching not that long ago, and they disclosed there was 46 WhatsApp groups for that particular organization. And I was like, wow. <laughs> um, no, and I think SAP is brilliant. There was definitely a place for smartphones. There's definitely, we had a conversation and then someone unsubscribed from all the groups. And I was like, that's not, that's not what I'm wanting. It's not about doing that. But there's, I, I t- and turned it back on and there was 150 messages. And I was like, wow, we had four different WhatsApp groups, pinging, pinging, pinging about various different things. Not all work related. A lot of it is mum groups. <laughs> Anyone with kids of a certain age will understand the the kind of WhatsApp parent groups and can be a bit full on as well. But absolutely, we talk a lot about switching off, right? How do how do we switch off? Because if we don't switch, do we have to switch on and off? It's another conversation, right? Do we have to switch on? Now I'm in work, off. Now I'm off work. But you've talked about in previous podcasts the the link between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. If we are on all the time we're not in rest and recovery we're not in that parasympathetic nervous system at all and we've got a fantastic device that we use for people which is brilliant called first beat and it measures high variability oxygen levels it it goes deep into looking at your stress zones and i love it because it's actually a bit of a slap in the face of look you're not actually getting any recovery you drink caffeine in the afternoon you're not sleeping your sleep isn't good quality sleep and it shows that if I go for an event in the afternoon and I'm drinking coffee and for me, I've got tinnitus. So if I'm at an event and there's lots of people, my body's working really hard. I love it. It lights me up. It gives me energy. But my body's working really hard to to hear what people are saying, to be fully present in the room and all of those things. That when I go to bed, if it's an afternoon event, and I, I struggle to go to bed. I have to do a breathwork session or a yoga session or something. Because otherwise I don't get into rest and recovery until three in the morning. And, you know, and I have this awareness, right? So I'm not going to not go to an afternoon event because that's not real, right? But it's, it's understanding. I think for me, using some of the technology now is really fantastic because it allows us to look at the impact it has and the impact that, you know, like I got as a business owner, I, I had all of my phone stuff on one phone. Last year I got a new phone. And I was like, that's my work phone. All the time I've been employed, I've had a work phone and and a home phone. So that is now my work phone. This is my home phone. And it's made such a difference because I don't check emails when I'm not working. I don't, like, I choose a time. So if 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 I want to check emails, like, I don't work on a Monday, but I've had some students working. So they've been working Monday. So I've had things available on a Monday. And it's been exhausting because I've not had that rest day. So when they finish, I've really noticed a difference because I've actually had Mondays to switch off, which I didn't have before. So just you can turn notifications off on your phone. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. So you can actually have it set for a schedule. So I set my emails for eight till seven or something, and then they don't get synced automatically. They sync if you open it and scroll it, but they don't get synced. And I was trying that at the weekends before I got a separate phone. But for me, it, it, it was too tempting. <laughs> it's too tempting. Just scroll, right? And, and I think I get FOMO, fear of missing out. So I don't want to I, I don't want to miss out on something that might be important. And it's also a habit. I think clicking into 
WhatsApp and clicking into emails is almost like an automatic thing we do now without even thinking about uh, it. Yeah, you're bang on there about how habits form so quickly because you pick up your phone, you think, I'll tap my email, just check if there's anything important. Any of this, I'll, if you say, I'll just, you're on a slippery slope. It could be five minutes, but it's, it's about where does your attention go? So a couple of things here. Environment design is really interesting. And I've worked with people who've done this and we've set this up in for people I've worked with. If you design your environment in a certain way, it will have a certain output. For example, if you work from home and you're trying to get this work-life balance, you work from home and you've got your desk in your bedroom or your desk in your kitchen, one of the classic fallouts from COVID. The, the visual stimulus around you, it could be like your personal space, will still trigger you into connecting to personal. And vice versa, if you're working in the kitchen and you've still got your laptop set up when you're having dinner, you are visually still, your peripheral vision, your brain saying, yeah, laptop's there. Maybe I need to just write that note or just send my client a thingy. And off we go. So what is in our visual field, our environment, is in some ways very easy to design. We can change our room. You, As you said, you could buy a second phone. You could work from a separate place. I use, I use co-working uh, spaces sometimes. Environment design is one of the easiest ways to leverage because if we are, tr quote, trying not to check our emails, that takes effort and energy. That's, that's draining. Creating habits around environment. Where is the phone or is no phone? Or, for instance, I never take a phone in my gym. Never. Yeah, I, I just train because that's my space. It's on do not disturb. It's locked away. And But I see people on the phone in the gym. I'm like, wow. I know, <laughs> I know some people are looking at you know, online trainers and that can work, but your attention's not there. And for those of us who know me, I train a lot and I, I do a lot of strength and conditioning and loads of fitness work. If you are doing strength and uh, fitness of any nature and your break time or rest time is you're on the phone, you've put your body into a state of misattention. I'll just check my work email before I do my next deadlift. It is the worst way to train because you're not present. You're not in the physiology of what you're doing and your attention, you've just outsourced it and it's draining yeah, this whole thing around environment design, I think, is super, super important. Really, really important, yeah. isn't it? And I think as well, the like the working from home thing, like if if you've got mess somewhere, I have children, they create mess. It's like a, an avalanche of disaster before they leave the house. And if I was to then go around and if I was sitting, like I have a garden office, because if I was sitting in the house, I would be doing the dish. I'll just do the dishwasher. Oh, I just prepped it. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll just, there is the I'll just, isn't it, all the time. And I'll just tidy up their rooms or I'll just sort this out. I'll just sort that out. And, I, and like you say, and I think there's all this conversation around multitasking and monotasking, isn't there? But we can't multitask. It takes 23 minutes to get back on task again. And so before you know it, your working day has disappeared and you feel like you haven't achieved anything because you've, you've been like your attention and your flow has been elsewhere and you haven't focused. It's the same when you're scrolling on social media. There was a really interesting conversation you had with Matt and your podcast where you were talking about social media scrolling and stuff. And it was really interesting because it just really resonates. So many people have that issue where they, oh, I just check Facebook or I just check LinkedIn or I just check you know, TikTok or whatever it is. And then before you, you're on like a video frenzy of, of seeing other people mapping out their lives, which A, makes you have comparisonitis, good old comparisonitis, where you go, oh, I'm not good enough and what am I, I'm not doing that, maybe I should be doing that. And then it also makes you look around and go, oh, that's what I want to strive for. And then it's, sometimes that could be healthy, right? You can go, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to change some habits and, and I'm going to focus on that conversation that Sal had about like doing this, that, and the other, I'm going to do that. But quite often you get suckered into the next thing and it's, it's ads and stuff that come up. Um, a lot of people don't know they can just turn the ads off as well. <laughs> and just like little little hacks, I guess, as yeah, you go through yeah. it, isn't it? It's, it's such an important thing. I, I've got a client and I'm going to be sharing to me, she's super, super busy, super successful, super busy, parent, all the stuff. I was doing a lot of time on social media. And, and we, we got into the question like, okay, because it was around about energy and your know, home life and work life. So it was the work life balance conversation. And, and I, I got interested. Okay, so what's, what's driving it? What are you looking for when you're on Instagram or TikTok or one of the, one of the platforms? And because I asked, can you tell me how good Instagram was last night? And what post did you see? And they're like, I can't remember any of it. I literally couldn't remember any. Okay, so it has no stickiness. It, it's just busy. 
And actually what we found was this person was looking to downregulate. They were learning to switch off. Now, now the sentiment and the intent is perfect, right? I want to switch off. I've had a busy day. You can't switch off when you're being dopamine spiked, right? You're being pumped. That's like trying to switch off while sprinting. It doesn't work. Your nervous system is going jacked up and then you're moving to a sympathetic nervous system. But the sentiment and the need is there. I want to switch off. So sometimes it's about checking that homeostasis in the mind. Okay, I know I have this habit of scrolling and I know it doesn't work. How can I choose better for my work-life integration? Which might look like, uh, and for me, it's always getting into the body, some form of movement. Breeding is a beautiful discipline. I read loads. I, I love reading. And just simply being kind to yourself, I think is the important thing here. You, we all want to switch off. There's nothing, quote, wrong with social media scrolling. But for every minute of attention you give that, you've, you've given that minute of your life away to someone else and they ain't paying you. And if you are tired and you're using things like social media and, and tech to take your attention away, that is not down regulation, that's distraction. So sometimes it takes a, a bit of a kind of slap around the face to realize like, I'm just distracting myself. Yeah, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm just, that's okay. We don't want to get beat up, but it's like, what do you actually want? I want to sleep well. Okay, cool. Let's put better practice in place. Phone away. Book out. You know, walk before bed or whatever it is you need to do. But coming awake to what is going on. And I wanted to say something that you said there and I pick up on it. Attention. So if we're looking for work-life balance, then where's your attention? As you, you've already beautifully alluded to. Where's your attention as a busy mom if you're multitasking? Are you like, oh, just do this, just do that? If you cannot control your attention, and again, don't, there's no need to beat up on oneself about this because it's not easy, but being able to hold attention on something is becoming a real masterful gift. It's hard, right? Yeah, it's, it's like why I do heavy, heavy weightlifting because you can't not pay attention when you're trying to lift your body weight off the floor, right? You, you can't be thinking, oh, should I just call so-and-so and how does my shorts? You have to focus. And that's why I love um, uh, strong practice, strong physical training practice, because you have to pay attention. Yoga as well, you can pay attention, but for some of us, your mind can still go off there. So whatever way works, but how we manage our attention. What practices are, are you working with your clients about attention management and attention control to some degree? How do you work with them? Yeah. For me, you've alluded to it anyway, is the awareness like quite often we, we're not aware that it's a thing, especially as, as, as a parent, my kids will be like, oh, can you just do this? Can you just do that? Can you just, mom, can you do this, mom? I don't know how many times they say mom in a day. It's, it's painful. And the amount of times I say to them in a minute, in a minute, and, and I've really become aware of that recently. I think like from COVID, obviously we're on our phones. I was trying to manage the business while being with the kids you want your phone instead of the computer trying to juggle stuff and I think my daughter took did a, a picture of me with my phone and that for me was like wow that's not how I want to be represented in her world what was important to me and that and that for me was enough of a of a boundary kind of setting that actually I'm not going to be the mom that's on the phone all the time that's not something that I'm going to be so for me, it's looking with, with people of what are your boundaries? Like we're in a culture where we like to say yes to stuff a lot. We're in a culture where everything is at our fingertips. We can get anything we want whenever we want, pretty much. So how do we secure really clear boundaries for ourselves to be able to give attention to the things that are important to us? Like when I do my exercise in, I listen to, I have my phone because I listen to Spotify or I listen to a podcast. I quite like listening to a podcast when I go for a run. It's quite it just because running then feels effortless it doesn't feel like I'm running because I'm listening to something but to be fully present and have the attention on the thing that you're doing is a really really hard thing and I think it is the understanding and awareness it starts with that because to make any kind of change you need to be aware that there's a problem and a lot of people aren't aware that there's a problem because they just that's just what they're doing so having that awareness that there's a thing and then looking at how do I want that to look? If I want to focus on eating healthier or I want to focus on doing more exercise or I want to focus on, we've got seven, seven pillars of well-being. So like when we think of well-being, we think of the physical, right? We think of sleep, we think of eating and we think of exercise, but that's only one element. We've also got the mental health, like how are you feeling? And the amount of people that say like, how are you? And it's a flipping like hello, right? 
but like how many people actually ask friends and colleagues like how are you actually like how are you actually doing like are you okay are you especially if you're concerned about somebody it's that real attention asking really clear questions having the right question I think with coaching and therapy any intervention that's like a helping practitioner intervention having the right question to ask someone to get them to think to, to trigger an emotion to trigger a feeling in their body and it's that like how it connects to your body is so important because once you're connected with it you're aware of it and then you can change it if you need to and so having that kind of really clear outline for people of what they need to do how they need to be and and working on themselves I think is we we talk about self-care right and we we think oh yeah it's it's fluffy it's like going to a spa and having massages and stuff and oh yeah that's lovely isn't it but but there should be something in your day every day that gives you something for you in whatever capacity that is that's not work related that's not you know something that you feel like you have to do but something that you want to do something that that makes you feel good because if you don't have anything that makes you feel good, what's the point, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. All, all this work and no play, it's seriously, what is the point? And I think that that's one of the brutal questions that needs to be asked. And, and questions are, vehicles of attention, to quest. That's where the word question comes from, to quest, to seek. And a, and a, and a good coach and therapist will, will know this. Perhaps other people, oh yeah, that's what it means. But it's it's a powerful thing. And when we self-quest, where we go, yeah, what really matters to me? Yeah, it's fine growing my business or working hard in my company and all that. But what really matters to me? Is your marriage or your work job more important? That brutal question sometimes, but sometimes you've got to ask it, right? Oh God, I haven't really paid attention at home. I, I need to get my, get, get my things together. Or are you, are you going to avoid your children for the first 16 years and catch up with them later? Because you can't buy that back. No matter how many millions you've got in the bank, you can't buy time. So these questions sometimes are really uncomfortable. And really enlightening. So I, I, I heartily recommend to all, if we're seeking work-life balance, ask the questions like, what really matters to me? What do I value? As Claire, you've already said, who do I want to be? And, and know that stuff and then start to get really clear. Okay, I've got some choices to make here. If you want to be fit and well when you're midlife and older, you can't get away with not exercising and eating well and sleeping well. It just, it just won't happen for you. It would just be too many biases against you being healthy. So you've got to choose what you want. And with choice, the word decision comes from decide. That's the same origin of homicide. It means to kill off a choice and have one choice. Multitasking, just stop it. <laughs> You're just doing lots of things badly, right? Take a choice. See the kids. Watch the TV program. Go to your meeting. Try Be there and be there fully is way more powerful. Now, I want to... I saw... Based on that, yeah. sorry to interrupt, Sal, but when I was looking at what to talk about for today, I saw a quote which I pulled out, which I really like, and it's, I'm not a product of circumstances, I'm a product of my decisions, Ooh. and it just goes really well with what you've just Beautiful. said. Beautiful. I just thought I'd throw Beautiful. that in. Beautiful. But yeah, to me, decisions is really important. Yeah. We have a choice, that's right? We have a choice. The ultimate gift of being a conscious human being, that, that's a belief I hold and that is that we have choice and, and I recognize that sometimes people have more privilege and some people have less of course that's the truth of the world but there's often a choice and okay what choice can I make and even if your job demands are difficult and you've got to put the hours in fine but what choice can I make here can I when I come home be really at home whatever it is what choice can I make because that is your power and if you give that choice away plenty of people take it whether it's uh, an internet company whether it's a Silicon Valley company People want your choices, yeah. so sell them wisely. And with choice comes opportunity as Absolutely. well, right? So how about we bring this to a close? I, I, we've taken everyone on a, on a bit of a journey here around all the things, but if, we're, if we've come away from striving for work-life balance but understand we need it in the context that we understand, what last guidance points would you like to share, Claire, that you would say these are key things that are going to really help you find a healthy and a, and a, and a more appropriate work-life balance? I think it's, I think a few top tips is like understanding yourself, understanding where, what, what, what's important to you, where your values are, what you want out of life, like what, what gets you going, what, what makes you who you are, how you want to live your life. Understand that you can make choices within that process. 
for me, it's it's having an understanding of your well-being. So looking at the pillars of the well-being, which we haven't really touched on today, and it's a whole conversation in its own right, but having an understanding of how you as a person links in with your well-being, links in with your emotional intelligence, and links in with your mental fitness, mental toughness, and how all of those things enhance you to get to to do to to get the performance that you want and and to do the things that you want and re- that are important to you having really clear boundaries and setting clear expectations really nice powerful yeah think, super salient points yeah. i i i i agree it works for me i love what you said there and i hope hope if you're taking notes get that down or replay it one thing i'd just like to speak to is is understanding that it starts within the ecosystem of you is your physiology your emotional system and your mind we often look outwards it's how the human system is designed we will look out through our eyes we see the world around us but start at home take care of your body be strong be active and this isn't a quick fix i don't buy any quick fixes with the with the whole health thing. this is a lifestyle it could take it could take you 10 years to get the body composition you want or the health you want but you'll be there in 10 years so keep going start with the body check your emotional state and as claire spoke about we've only touched on it but learn about breath work get the basics get the basics of how to breathe and regulate because emotions drive our thinking to a large extent and check in with your with your mind as claire you said values what do you really want your choices if you come from those spaces your work-life choices will become quite clear and they will probably become much more more in line with what you want so there, there are my thoughts on how to perhaps pull this together for a better work-life coherence perhaps yeah, and it's understanding that everyone's different. It was quite interesting. Even this morning, somebody phoned me literally just before I came on and I said, oh, I, um, I'm just about to go into a meeting. And they said, oh, I could phone you at lunchtime. I know that's not appropriate, but how about one o'clock? And I was like, he's assuming that I have a lunch break at one o'clock, but I don't have a lunch break at one o'clock. So it's quite interesting, isn't it? How that kind of awareness just generally is is with other yeah. people but taking breaks is really important so having an understanding of the when you when you do choose to work in an evening why you choose to work in an evening if you choose to do something at the weekend why you're choosing to do something at the weekend and if you're choosing to take time during your working day to do things like fitness or something for you it's they're not feeling guilty about that as well because that can really take over yeah, absolutely yes make choices wisely yeah own your choices own your choices <laughs> <laughs> and keep an eye on the <laughs> sneaky guilt that can sneak up and yeah just get present claire thank you for sharing lots of thoughts experience knowledge and wisdom from your perspective i very much appreciate you coming and join me in the conversation i trust if you're listening that you have scribbled down notes you've tapped them in your phone if you've just listened and gone oh, that's all really interesting and you really want work-life balance? <laughs> I would say, and this is what I do in my podcast when I listen to other people, I, I, I take it like a, a lecture and I, I play it back and I make my notes and I integrate it into my understanding. So if there's something that's just chimed with you, play this back, get the notes, make the points, and lastly, take action. <laughs> I do the one thing. I don't know if you do that, Sal, but just choose one thing from what we've spoken about today and that you're going to do different. Perfect. Just choose one, one thing. thing. We shall leave you on that. Choose one thing. And as you, of course, of course, you can always reach out on the various connections on the pod page. You can reach me at the site. All details will be following up after this piece. Thank you, dear listener, for joining us. Thank you, Claire, for being in conversation with me. I've really enjoyed this. And until the next one, take care. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe. And if a friend would benefit from hearing this, do send it on to them as well. If you would like to get in touch yourself, then you can go to my website, which is saljeffries.com, spelled S-A-L-J-E-F-F-E-R-I-E-S, saljeffries.com. Hit the Get In Touch link, and there you can send me a direct message. If you'd like to go one step further and learn whether coaching can help you overcome a challenge or a block in your life, then do reach out and I offer a call where we can discuss how this may be able to help you. Until the next time, take care.